Hi there, my name is David Kenny. Welcome to Light From Above. We're talking about a series of lessons about being a New Testament Christian. And today's lesson has the idea of, we're going to look at the Apostle Paul. You know, a New Testament Christian strives to be like the Apostle Paul. These are based on a series of lectures which I attended in Memphis. I'll show you a picture here, Robert Taylor. Now, this picture is not from the lectureship. It's from back a little bit before then, about 2011. Um, Brother Taylor was the last one to give the lecture through that week, and it was a very great week, but it was a very tiring week because I went to Gospel Broadcasting Network and had a lot of things going on. And quite frankly, during his lecture, I sat there in the pew and started shaking with a fever. I, didn't, I was not feeling very well, uh, but he did an excellent job, and I was able to, I'm able to hear him talk about the Apostle Paul uh, several times. He's been a very dear friend of our family for a long time. And so it was great to see him, but I didn't want to go up and shake his hand because I was obviously getting sick. So this is actually a picture from before. But Robert Taylor is known to be a great admirer of the Apostle Paul. That's, that's no secret to anyone that knows him. As a matter of fact, it's no secret, especially when you read what he said in the lectureship book. And this is what he said in the book about the Apostle Paul. It is the studied judgment of this writer that Paul is the greatest man except Christ, to tread God's green footstool. Minus question or quibble, he is the finest personification of Christianity the world has ever witnessed, or ever will, for that matter. Paul is the undisputed champion of Christianity in the way he lived and what he taught. Like the Messianic master whom Paul loved and served, he lived the Christian life and taught in the foregoing order, Acts 1.1. 1, 1. Like Ezra, Paul prepared his heart to know God God's will, and to teach his peers the unsearchable riches of Christ, Ezra 7.10, Ephesians 3.8. This assigned manuscript will delineate Paul's beautiful and brilliant brand of vibrant Christianity. And I encourage you to read, uh, get that lectureship book, and read what uh, Brother Taylor wrote. And there's also other lectures there that we're not going to cover in this series of lessons. There's a series of lessons by some very qualified women who present some material there, and it's excellent reading. Uh, and I encourage you to get the book. But as we look at the life of the Apostle Paul, we're going to look at it in three main areas of his life. Uh, I have down Saul, who became known as Paul. He was a persecutor of the faith. He was the defender of the faith. And then he was persecuted for the faith. Now, when we talk about Saul, we need to realize that you know, he was a persecutor of the faith. Sometimes you'll read across, you'll come across his name as Saul of Tarsus. This is the same person. And we're introduced to Saul of Tarsus clear back in Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 8, in that area of the Bible. At this time, you know, Saul is a very devout Jew. He's extremely well educated, very qualified. And you'll notice that you know, he's busy persecuting the church. You notice here in Acts chapter 8, 1 through 3, it says, At that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Now, if you go back and look at Acts chapter 7, 58, you see the early occurrence of Saul. And it says there, it says, And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, Acts 7.58. The person they're talking about being stoned is Stephen. Stephen has appeared before the high priest. Jewish leaders are there. Saul is there. And he is having a serious discussion, a dispute. And he delivers, Stephen delivers this address. And basically, they get so angry at him that it says there in Acts 7.54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. They became angry. It's not like back in Acts chapter 2, where it says they were cut to the heart, and, and, and they interrupted the sermon, wanted to know, what, what should we do? We, want, we, want to, you know, we, we know we crucified Jesus. What are we to do about it? These, This group of people had the opposite reaction. They became enraged. They didn't like what Stephen was saying. And they couldn't refute it. And they hated him. And that just boiled over into anger. And they actually stoned him to death. Now, it shouldn't, shouldn't surprise you that 
when you, even though you may have truth and logic and the facts all on your side, it's not uncommon for people to be just bent on what they're going to do. And there is no truth, there's no logic, there's no facts that are going to stop them to do it. And, and if you stand in their way, they will step right on you. And that's what happened to Stephen. And Saul would go on this campaign of trying to stamp out Christianity. It says in Acts 8, 1, now Saul was consenting to his death, to Stephen's death. He was there. He was involved. He was a part of that decision process. No doubt, I mean, he probably had words with Stephen. Perhaps he was one of the ones that were, you know, debating with him and becoming enraged because he couldn't refute what he was saying. It says here in Acts 8 that, you know, he went on this rampage to try to stamp out Christianity. And if you go into Acts chapter 9, 1 and 2, it says, And Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So now, you know, he goes, Saul is so, um, you know, he's very well qualified. He's able to get the authorization to do it. But he goes to the high priest, he gets letters of authorization to go to Damascus and you know, continue his persecution there. And so that's what he's doing. He's on the way there. And then Acts 9, 4, all of a sudden the bright light appears. And the people, are, you know, they're stunned. And Saul hears these words from heaven. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Acts 9, verse 4. Saul's confused. He doesn't know what's going on. He asks, well, who are you? Or who are you, Lord? Or who are you? He doesn't, you know, and he gets this response. Now, imagine, if you will, and put yourself in, in Saul's shoes. You're very zealous. You're, you're a dedicated Jew, and you're, you're killing Christians. You're killing them. You're putting them in prison. You're going, and then, he, you know, this event happens, and he says, who are you? And this, this is the reply. He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads, Acts 9.5. What were those goads? You know, what were those you know, stick promptings? Well, could it have been the message that Stephen was telling him that he couldn't refute? Probably had something to do with it. What about all those people, all those families, all those you know, good people? that he imprisoned or killed. What do you think happened? You know, Jesus said, you know, you're persecuting me. Well, Jesus is in heaven. Who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about his disciples. In a flash, Saul comes to the realization he's on the wrong side. He's on the wrong side. And so he shakes. And he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? I can't imagine just what Saul must have been feeling, realizing that what he had been doing was wrong, and how and what he, to the extent of what he did was wrong. And the Lord tells him, go to Damascus, and someone would come and tell him, and this is Acts 9, 6. It says, what you must do do must do now paul you know he tells this uh, conversion that he has he tells it on more than one occasion in acts 22 14 through 16 he tells what he was told to do and what he did and this is what it says the god this is ananias ananias is the person that goes to him and this is what ananias ananias tells saul he says the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth, for you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now notice what you must do. Now, that would include going and preaching and all that, and he's going to be a witness and all that. But notice 
It also included these instructions. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now notice that arise and baptize and wash away your sins precedes calling on the name of the Lord. Today we have people that tell you, call on the name of the Lord, and baptism, you know, they just sort of leave that part out. But Ananias didn't do that. Saul would be transformed. He realized that he was wrong. He was persecuting the church. He was a very dedicated person. And that dedication switched. He became the defender of the faith. And he was very effective. Notice what it says here in Acts chapter 9, 20 through 22. Immediately he preached to Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called him this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Incidentally, the Christ there, that is also the Messiah. One's the Greek form, Christ. The other's the Hebrew form, Messiah. He is the Messiah. So Paul has now become a defender of the faith. And he's going to have a long journey, several journeys, ahead of him. Jesus explained to Ananias, he told him about Paul in Acts 9, 15 through 16. It says, go, he's sending him to Saul, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. You know, it might sound really good, that part about appearing before kings. I mean, that sounds, that sounds pretty exciting. What a great career. I'm going to present before kings they are going to hear me speak. But notice he said how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. It's not going to be an easy journey. And things happen to Saul. Things come about that happen that probably Saul had no idea that the things that were being orchestrated by God or the Holy Spirit, Jesus are being orchestrated, happened, but probably didn't happen the way he thought they were going to happen. And there's incredible examples of that that we could read about, but we don't have time to do that. But he became so effective. You know, there's a reason, you know, there's a reason why he was a great defender, because, you know, he was so committed, so publicly committed to killing Christianity, and now he's defending it. And so the people who are on his side now are his enemies, and he has become their target. And some people want him dead because of it. And it's interesting here in Acts 23, 12 through 13, it says, And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. Well, it's interesting, you know, I don't know what happened to those guys. I don't know if they renounced their vow. If they didn't, then they died of starvation because they never were able to kill them. Why? Well, because God had other plans. Jesus had other plans for Paul. He would go to Rome. Uh, there was nothing they could do to stop it, even though they wanted to kill him. But you know what? Saul, Paul, incidentally, Paul is his Roman name. Saul was his Jewish name. Some people mistakenly think that God changed his name, like maybe Abraham, God changed his name from Abram. No record of that. It's just, you know, people had multiple names depending on what um, language they were using or what system they were under. Saul was his Jewish name. Paul was his Roman name. But he went through a lot of persecution. The man who went out and persecuted people because of their faith would become persecuted defending that faith. Notice here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 22 through 28, he gives, now this is just a partial list. This, is, this isn't all. 
I just grabbed these few verses and I'd read them to you. We talk about Paul persecuted for the faith. You know, we, we should, you know, when we think we're being persecuted, maybe it'd be good for us to read through this list and take an assessment. But this is what Paul wrote, 2 Corinthians 11, 22 through 28. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness beside the other things, which comes upon me daily. My concern for all is for all the churches. He was persecuted for the faith. He would, you know, he would go on and do many wonderful things for Christianity. He did a lot of great things. You know, he would eventually end up in a Roman prison. And you know, it wouldn't be the first time he'd be in the Roman prison if you know, the historical facts are the way that it may laid out for us to believe. He would come there again. First time he was acquitted. Second time Nero had him executed. Now the Apostle Paul was beheaded by Nero around 67 AD there in Rome. But you know what? All the apostles and a lot of Christians faced severe hardship. All of them, there are so many of them. Matter of fact, all the apostles, save John, were executed or killed because of their faith in Christ. Now you might think, oh, well, John was the exception. He must have had a pretty easy life, but he did not. He was persecuted himself. And so these people would do that to Christians. Apostle Paul, he conducted three missionary journeys. He was traveling everywhere from Jerusalem to Rome. He was all over the Mediterranean there in Asia Minor, Turkey and Greece and Italy and along Palestine, that, that border there. He worked through there all the time. Matter of fact, in Romans 15, 24, and 28, there's even a reference there of him possibly even going to Spain. So he traveled, he did all these things, he converted many people. He didn't convert everybody, and he suffered a lot of persecutions. He wrote several letters or epistles. Matter of fact, it's interesting, you know, some people say, you know, um, we can just ignore Paul's writings. Well, maybe they don't understand that Paul wrote the majority of the written record we have in the New Testament. He wrote Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Hebrews, you know, some people think he wrote it, some people don't, but even that one aside, he wrote the majority of the New Testament. His writings were not of his own. You know, some people today, they say, oh, yeah, we don't have to worry about what Paul wrote. That's Paul. We need to follow what Jesus wrote. You know, we want to follow the Gospels. We don't care about Paul. But you know what Paul wrote in Galatians 1.12? He says, For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. What's it? His writings, his words. He's an inspired apostle. He was appointed by Jesus to do these things. To ignore him, to ignore his writings, is the same thing as ignoring Jesus Christ himself. His writings are authoritative. We need to take them seriously. Matter of fact, they're so authoritative that the Apostle Peter makes this statement. This is in 2 Peter chapter 3, 15 through 17. He says, And consider the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also with the rest of the scriptures. Now notice a couple things in that reading. One, hard to understand. You know, the Apostle Paul's writings, 
they're not easy. I mean, there's parts of them you can understand, but I mean, there's some challenging things there. If anybody just think Christians are a bunch of simpletons, they never read the writings of the Apostle Paul, or they haven't studied him very much. Some things are hard to understand. And notice he says that there are people that are untaught and unstable, and they twist, they twist, you know, they twist the scriptures to their own destruction. People that listen to them and their twisted message are going to end up in their own destruction as well. We have to, you know, you really need to study the scriptures for yourself. Make sure you do that. How do you know that what you're being taught isn't being taught by someone who's untaught and unstable and that they're twisting it? How do you know that? Well, the only way you're going to know it is to study it yourself. Also, the third thing about what Peter wrote here, about Paul's writings, he puts them in the same classification, Scripture. Scripture. So, when you ignore the writings of the Apostle Paul, you're ignoring Scripture. You're ignoring, you're ignoring the words that Jesus Christ gave. You know, why, did, why did the Apostle Paul do these things? I mean, why would he go through those kinds of things? Yeah, you know, there's people that, you know, when they looked at you know, when they look at Paul's life, they probably thought, you know, he's got to be out of his mind. He's got to be insane. Why would he do that? Why would he do those things? Well, Paul knew the truth. He knew it. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. He knew what the truth was. You know, I have discussions with people, you know, on Facebook and different things, and some of them get, you know, they get a little animated about it. And they, they want to argue about just things of this life. They want to argue about, you know, Christianity and their secular, atheistic, agnostic views, and they want to keep it within the context of just this life. Be very careful when you talk with people like that, that you don't forget. And be sure to point it out to them. Christianity is not just about this life. It's about eternal life. You see, all these other religions out there, I mean, you know, Buddhism and Hinduism and uh, Islam and Mormonism, all these, uh, all these other religions out there, there's a lot of them. If you just confined the debate to the things of this world, you're selling Christianity short. You're selling it short. Christianity is not just about this life. It is about this life, having the best life possible. But it's also about eternal life. The things of this world, you know, we may have to suffer persecution for because the things of this world are temporal. They're temporary. The things, you know, we may live to be a hundred. You know what a hundred is? It's nothing compared to eternity. There's no comparison. I mean, I could give you all kinds of, you know, you know, very exaggerated, you know, there, there's no comparison. And Paul knew it. He knew it. Notice what he said here in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. These are probably some of his last written words. He said, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to those who have loved his appearing. Notice there it says, Not just to me, but to all those who loved his appearing. You know, we need to recognize that, you know, our life in the past, we need to put that behind us. We need to become Christians. And we need to remain faithful all the days of our life so we have that hope of that crown that's being laid up by the one who wore a crown of thorns so we could wear the crown of victory. Thanks for watching our program. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. 
or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map, don't even open their Bibles yet, and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people, or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood. And only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.